This is kind of a special moment because 40 years ago, I'm 45, no, 40 years ago, <laughs> at Williston Assembly of God Church in, what year was it, 1977, that service changed my life forever because I had the opportunity, standing at the altar, and married a Williston Assembly of God girl 40 years ago. Pat Sorum, over here someplace. She's around here someplace. There she is. And we're going to talk a little bit about fear today. And if I would have known, and Pat would have known, what was ahead of us when we said, I do, we would have ran. And you would have too. We have no idea what we're getting into. It's the best adventure I've ever been on. But fear, we're going to talk a little about facing and, and moving forward in our life. When we sang a little bit ago about being in a valley of fear, sometimes we're in a place where we're experiencing anxiety and we're going through a storm. And how do you move forward? And um, the verse this morning that I want to open up with is just one of those verses that just kind of grab you. It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I can, well, money, uh, anxiety, like the world. The Lord is a stronghold of my life. He's a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Aren't those powerful words? Pastor Colin prayed today. I was in the service a couple weeks ago and in my home area, and there was a lady who I've known for a long time, and after the service, she came up to me and she said, Jim, I'm just so full of anxiety and fear. This world is so shaking, and I just don't know what to do. And I just looked at her, and I said, but remember that this is not our kingdom, that we, as servants of Christ, we live in a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Because we know who's in charge. We know how it ends. We know it all, don't we? So how do you move forward during those times? I look back at my 64, oh, that's all, 64 years of existence on this earth, I look at times when I say, oh man, I let fear define me in that season. I let fear control me. I didn't move forward with something I felt God or something in my life. And I regret those moments. Because fear has a way of stopping our lives. Has a way of just anxiety. I remember it was um, back in 1988 one of those moments I felt like God helped me face a fear that changed, was one of those moments that did change the course of my life. I was invited by, actually it was the president of Nicaragua, Daniel Ortega, back in 1988 to go into Nicaragua during the war and to do a project there. And the war was going on and I had assembled a group of about 16, 17 people where we've been called to do this project. In a long story, I'm not going to go into that, but it was an amazing thing that I've been asked to do. And just before we went down there, all the news and the world news was about all the problems in Nicaragua. Doesn't that usually happen? Just when you start, and the anxiety of the group and all that was going on there and people blowing things up and people fighting and whatever. And I remember it was two nights before to leave, and the, and the wife of one of my engineers who was going with me called me up, and she was a bit of a prophetess. Those people scare me sometimes. <laughs> she caught, called me on the phone. She said, this is what I'm going to tell you. If you guys go to Nicaragua, you're not going to come back. Someone's going to be killed. Do not go. Whoa, that's a tough spot to be in. On one hand, I thought, God had called us there miraculously. We are to go there. And this lady not only said it to me, but she said it to the whole group. Talk about a sleepless night. What do I do? And I remember the next day, early in the morning, getting up. And I began to pray about it. And it was just this kind of thing, revelation. I wonder what Paul would have done. He gets beat up, almost to the point of death, shakes the dust off and goes to the next city. Wonder what Jesus, who said, I must face the cross 
And he set his face towards the cross and he endured whatever he had to do no matter what the cost was. And I soon realized I had the answer. The grace that has been given to me is not a cheap grace. It's a grace that changed my life and we are to give our life back to God. I assembled a group together and I said, all right, what do you want to do? I said, if you want to back out now, that's fine, go ahead. All of us went down there and we experienced this amazing victory like I'd never experienced before. It was just amazing what God did, miracle after miracle, as we established this pride, began to, we bought cement from the Russians, we bought blocks from the Cubans, we put together this building. And God put in my heart that I should go to Nicaragua every year of my life for the rest of my life. And that was 30 years ago, and I've never missed a year. Those are divine moments when fear, and I believe the author of fear is who? To keep us from doing what God has destined us to do. And in that moment, that woman, she was not a bad woman, but fear had gripped her for her husband. And when people say, this is what God said to me, I say, God can speak to me too. <laughs> and I told it in tension. And today, there's an incredible story that I, I, I just, the stories in the Bible are amazing. I had a dad who, pretty cool, he would read Bible stories to us, five boys, before we went to bed. And, and I always say, wow, that's in the Bible? That's in the Bible? And this is a cool story in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and 14. It really is about two approaches to fear. Now, the situation is the Philistines were people who were harassing the Israelites all the time. They were just always harassing. And they'd kind of subdued them, and they were under their thumb, and they were under their control. And one of the things they did so they wouldn't result, revolt, they said, we will take all the blacksmiths, and we remove them. And, and if you have to have your plows sharpened, your sickles sharpened, your whatever sharpened, you have to go to the Philistines because they didn't want anybody making any weapons. And so Samuel came to Saul and said, this is ridiculous. You guys have not listened to me. God is a victor. You guys are living in this terrible time in your life, and I've given you the victory. Now, I'm telling you today, if you go against them, you're going to win a victory. Okay, this is where it gets really interesting. And so, if you look in, on the board, 1 Samuel 13, 22, so on the day of the battle, not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or a spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had one. Now how many think you like those odds? How many like to be in that army? <laughs> All right, there is, if you look into the story, it says there were 3,000 Philistines' chariots, there were 6,000 charioteers, and numerous soldiers, and they were banking up around Israelite. Saul had put together this group of soldiers, and there's two swords. How many want to volunteer to that army? Huh? What's the odds there? Uh, I think I'm going to Canada. <laughs> two people had swords. And what happened is Saul the king took his sword and he gathered the people around him and instead of going out and advancing, they begin to be filled with fear and the, and the Bible says, if you look in, uh, it says, Saul remained at Gilgal and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. Quaking, I think, is like shaking. And Saul's men began to scatter. Paul was filled with fear. Here was this leader. Samuel spoke to Saul. This is your victory. And Saul had seen how God had worked. When God said something and he promised something, he would do it. He said, you go against them and the victory will be yours. Saul took his sword, put it down, gathered his troops around him, around a pomegranate tree, and they were quaking in fear. And all of a sudden, his army started running away. Okay, that's one approach to fear. Jonathan this incredible young man, the son of Saul, he had heard Samuel's words. If you go against the Philistines, I will be with you and you will have victory. So Jonathan pulled out his sword and the verse in 1 Samuel 14, 6, Jonathan said to his armor bearer, 
come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows and perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Here's John. Why are you sitting around? He took his sword up and said, I'm going to go pick a fight today. I'm going to go against those Philistines today. And the crazy part of it, his armor bearer who had carried his armor said, ah, I'll go with you. How many of you would have done that? I'm glad you didn't raise your hand because I wouldn't have done it. And here's what happened. This Jonathan, because he heard the word of the Lord, he accepted the promise Is there fear there? If there was, he believed that the faith in this almighty God would would be there in that moment. And he started to climb up the side of the cliff towards the outpost. Right straight at him. If it it would have been me, I would have went by night. I would have circled. He went right up the hill. And the Philistines saw them and they said, Look, the Hebrews are crawling out of their holes that they're hiding in. Come up here and we'll teach you a lesson. Jonathan, with his armor bearer, went right up, right to the top of that hill. And it was a garrison. A garrison is 20 people. And he took out that whole garrison with him and his armor bearer. And here's what happens about faith in this God who said, I am your stronghold. I am the one that you can trust. As soon as he started to take out that garrison, the earth began to shake. And all of a sudden, the Philistines thought there was a mighty army that was coming against them. And they saw the people flee. And all of a sudden, the whole army began to flee. They began stomping each other, killing each other. And Saul had an outpost guy looking over there and said, Saul, the Philistines are scattering. They're running. And here's the deal. Most of our prayers are like this. God, I will do it, but can you just slay him first? God, can you just take care of this first? But until we step into it with faith, take up that sword and start up that hill, that's when God moves. It takes some risk on our part, doesn't it? To go against our fear and say, God, you said it, I'm going to move towards it. What a different approach that day would happen. I want to just make a few applications today where maybe this is where we are in our life. What I have noticed over 38 years of working in a church, that fear does some really destructive things to people. Because fear drives us into hiding. Just like those Israelites in this verse, it says when the men of Israel saw the situation was critical, it was critical. All those people gathering and we have two swords, that's critical. And the army was hard pressed, they were hard pressed. And they hid in caves and thickets and rocks and pits and cisterns. How many of you have been there? Something in your life has caused you to worry. Your life has been filled with anxiety. What's next? I just think of so many of the kids that I've worked with over the years and get the pleasure to work with over at Eckerd. And so many of their lives are uncertain. Where do I go? What's next? You know, there's been so much uncertainty in their life. And for many of us, maybe it's a conflict at work or there's a conflict at home. And you're asked to face it and you withdraw in hiding and you just hope it goes away. You just cover it up and you just say, it's just too big. I can't deal with it and I just hope it goes away. Maybe it's your finances. They're overwhelming you and you live in fear of an anxiety about it and instead of facing it and realize that maybe I had a part in this, maybe I got myself in trouble, God says step into it and face it. Don't, don't hide. And maybe today you're in a fear that just keeps you stuck. You just feel stuck. You feel robbed of living and, 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 you, and, and this fear has controlled you and you just seems like you can't move forward. I'm telling you today that God has a way, and we're going to talk about that. There was something that happened to me, and I'm not a person that gets dreams and visions. Sometimes I dream about killing a big elk, but I'm not talking about that. But I probably had two in my life that I could say, this was a dream that was from God. This was a vision that, that came from God. And I remember I was a young minister just out of seminary a few years. I was in Indianapolis, Indiana, fairly large church, and Someone had disclosed to me 
about some awful thing that one of the elders of that church had done to them, spoke to them. It was, it was something that needed to be dealt with. It was, it was an elder, and this elder was one of the strongest personalities and leader of that church. And I remember the Lord saying to me, you have got to confront him about this thing that happened. And I was just this young minister and, 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 and just totally afraid of doing it in this big elders meeting on a Saturday morning. And I talked to the lead pastor and he said, we've got to deal with it. And I remember how fearful I was. I was just afraid. I could hardly sleep. And I remember going to sleep that night and I actually, I remember this dream. And it was one of those moments I'll never forget. I, I remember just as vivid as it had happened. I was over and there was a rock over there. And I was hiding behind the rock and here was an old, there was a guy coming, like an old western, and he had two pistols. And he is shooting at me. And I'm hiding. I am digging my face in the dirt, hiding, because these bullets are coming at me. I'm hiding. And I remember in the dream, just as vivid as it happened, as that this guy started coming closer and kept on shooting and shooting. And the closer he got, the more my body was not hid by the rock. And I remember there was a moment in the time when that rock no longer would protect me, that rock would no longer shield the bullets, that the bullets would end up penetrating me. And I remember in that dream that God just woke me up and said, then stand up and trust me. And I remember in my dream, I, mean, I felt sweat. That's how much I felt. And I stood up like this, and they started shooting. And guess what? The bullets didn't even hurt. They didn't even touch me. And God spoke to me and said, tomorrow... When you do what you have to do, stand up and I will be your protector. And I remember being in that meeting and confronting that person and it was awful. It, it, it was a barrage that came against me. Two years later, that elder went into discipline, went through the whole process that needed to happen because of what he did. Two years later, I, he, he was restored. He came to me and he said, you want to know? that one of the best days of my life is when you confronted me about that secret sin in my life because it changed me forever. There are just times when the fear wants to control us and God wants us to be used for a purpose and we must push against it and trust the Lord. Stand up. God will be your protector. I um, also know that fear not only causes us to go in hiding, just to Go in hiding. Just make it all go away. You know, I just put the covers over my head and maybe the problems will just go away. But the other thing it does is fear focuses on scarcity. So on the day of the battle, not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or a spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. Fear has a way of creating panic. Fear has a way that says, I'm not strong enough. I don't have enough resources. I'm not, I cannot do this. It's too big. It's always focused on what I can't do. It just says, just give up. Just hunker down. Just, just don't, just, you don't, you don't have what it takes. And that's a lie. That's a lie. I am weak, but what? He is strong. We are all weak. We can't do life on this planet by ourselves. And what I know is when you look at how Saul looked at that sword and he said, this is not enough. And he hunkered down behind his men and the men scattered. He saw that God was not strong enough. God was not a God of abundance. And Jonathan, he looked at his sword and he said, it's not my ability to fight. It's not how well I do with the sword. He said, God is a God who said he would bring victory today. And I'm just today, when you are in that moment, if I can just say you in the moment, and you look at your future, and you're filled with anxiety, you look at that situation you're facing, and you say, I don't have it. I don't have what it takes. I can't do it. I'm not able to do it. If you stop there, you who won? Who won? Your life just got robbed of what God wants for you. But if you stand there and say, you know something, God, I don't have enough. I am not smart enough. I can't figure it out. But guess who can? Huh? But guess who can? 
And if I step into that, God will make a way. What else would happen is fear separates us and ultimately begins to destroy us. Saul remained in Gilgal and all the troops with him were quaking with fear and, Saul, and Saul's men began to scatter. The movement of fear in our life will force us to alienate ourselves. Fear has a way of just, uh, just removing ourselves. And we, just, we, we get so afraid of everything. And, and, and then what, what it does when it separates you, you try to control your little world. Because if I can control my little world, then I feel peace at it. And I just feel people, they get shrink down. It, 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 it just separates you to the point where you try to control this little world. And if you control this little world, maybe nobody will affect it. And what happens, that world gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Fear separates us. And, and, and it ultimately will destroy us. But here is the encouraging word today, and I end with these things right here. Is how do I face forward? How do I move forward like Jonathan? How do I look at that and say the odds are against me? I should be quaking with fear. I should be trembling. But somehow I am going to face forward. I'm going to go up that mountain. What does it take? The first thing it takes is to see what I love. Many names of God, but one of my favorite names of God is God is the way maker. The first thing we see, and like Pastor Colin said, be still and know that I am God. I am God the way maker. And no matter where you are in life, if there's a mountain, that verse there that's up there says, I will go before you and I will level the mountain. First you get a vision that God is the way maker. He is the one who make a way with this. He is the one strong enough. He is the one mighty enough. And when I get a vision of who is with me, then I can what? I can begin to go forward. The first thing we have to do is see that God is who he said he is. He is our way maker. Jonathan, again, refused to accept that defeat was the answer. He knew that God had promised victory, and Jonathan knew this God personally. He had learned to trust him. And on that day, God made a way where there was no way. Next thing, Here's the tough one right here. I'd like to just say, okay, that's it. But facing forward next means that we step into our fears. Our willingness to step into our fears activates God's faith so there is a, we know that there is someone greater than our fears. Here, here's what I want to get right down to earth right with you right now. Many of our prayers are just like this. And I'm just saying because I do it myself. We face an obstacle. Here's our prayers. God, just take it away from me. How many have prayed that? God, just take it away from me. Or maybe it's just, just make it easier, God, if you just make life easier. Or some of us pray this. Uh, God, if you could just make my boss drop, I mean, if you could just take him away. How many have felt that? Or maybe it's this. God, if you could just make my, my kids nicer. God, just make my kids nicer. If they'd just be nicer, I'd be a better mom. No. God is saying, step up, parent. Step into it. What do we need to do? What do we need to be the, do to be the adult in the family? What do we need to be the dad, the mom, the, the single mom, the single dad? They're, God is never going to make them nicer. You're going to be there. And when you step into it, God will make a way to make it happen. Oh, God, if you would just make my wife kinder and nicer and they let her, let me buy that boat. God's saying, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Step into what you need to do to become a better husband. And guess what? The result will be your wife will be better. One of the hardest things for me to do, a number of years ago, I had to say, I need marriage counseling. But you're a pastor. You have a master's in counseling and family. You've taught to... We had three kids. I had no idea what we're doing. We had lost in the maze. And the hardest thing for me to do was to step into my situation 
God, I am not able to do this. I need help. And God used that situation like amazing. Stepping in to your fear, stepping into your situation is what God wants us to do. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, let's go out to the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows. Now this is what's amazing to me. What was his next words? And perhaps the Lord will help. How many say that's a real strong statement of faith? And perhaps the Lord will help. I'm just telling you today, and being in ministry for many years, people have always said, are you confident about this project? Have you heard from God 100%? And I'll look at them and say, maybe 50% at the most. Maybe 60 Where would faith be if it's all settled? You know, you got, okay, I'm going to start this project and I won't start it unless I have 20 million. There's no faith involved in that. Faith is realizing that you may be 51% and we're going to move forward. A grain of mustard seed is enough with God to move forward. So he's sitting around and God said, you step forward and I will activate. I will make a way. If you don't step forward, guess what? My hands are tied because faith is stepping in. And God will step forward when you step forward. That's part of what it is to move into your fears. Lastly, facing forward, the only way we can do it is together. I, I just think this is one of the most amazing things here. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead. I'm with you, heart and soul. I'm thinking, this guy is nuts. This guy's nuts. He's going against one sword, against a garrison of trained Philistine soldiers. Behind them are 6,000. And this armor bearer says, I'm with you, Jonathan. I'm with you. And those words are so powerful when you face fears in your life and anxieties. I am with you. I'm going to walk through it with you. Sometimes my faith isn't enough. But I borrow, I lend from your faith because you have faith that God is enough and sometimes I need that. That's why when we hit anxiety, anxiety and fears and we struggle, we don't alienate from church. We don't separate ourselves. We don't go there and just cover up. Oh, it, God, nobody... You come together. We're two or three gather in my name. I am where? I am in the midst. If you're facing fears right now, it can just destroy your life. It can stop you. It can, it can rob you of your destiny. If fear and anxiety control you. And, I, and, and, and today, God wants you to see that I'm a way maker. I can make a way where there is no way. And when I step into that thing that fears, that I'm so afraid of, God activates the powers of heaven to move forward into that. And then you're in the middle of it and you say, I can't do it alone. You're right, you can't do it alone. I need you. I need people. And we need that with each other, don't we?